Um, spend time in prayer, pull away, spend time in prayer. Or maybe he's put it on your heart to pull away and spend time, some time in fasting. Whether or not that's just one meal or, you know, skipping your candy run or whatever it is. Um, or maybe you've felt prompted to sow a seed. You know, what is that when you're being prompted like that? What, what is that? It's, of course, it's the leading of the Holy Spirit, but let me, let me tell you what it is because it, it goes much deeper than that. It's an invitation to trust him more. It's an invitation to allow him to develop in you this level of faith that will take you to victory every single time. Causes you to look at that a little differently, doesn't it? Many of you I shared with you about, um, about how in December of last year, we were already feeling a stirring in our heart that God was moving us from the Jones Center. And I had no idea where he was going to take us. We had gone out and we started looking at some locations, look at, looked at some buildings. We found one place, and we, I remember looking at one place and going, you know, we could make this work, but I didn't believe that God wanted us to just go somewhere to make it work. I believed that he had something definitive, in, you know, he had something specific in mind. And... <clears throat> So then in February, because I remember it was Super Bowl Sunday, and I didn't get to go home and eat all the snacks and eat all, we had all this grub that came over to our house, and they sent me videos. The Alvar, our neighbors, the Alvarez's bought all this meat, and Nicole sends me videos. And, and she sent me videos, and I'm going literally to a cabin out in the middle of nowhere to fast for three days. And I get videos of ribs and all kinds of amazing stuff and I'm just sitting and anyway but I felt prompted in February that the Lord wanted me to go go away get away for three days and really fast and pray I didn't know what it was about yes we needed a building but that wasn't that wasn't what was in my heart what I felt that I was being prompted to do was to just spend time with him for three days so I took my keyboard, and it just so happens when I felt that prompting that a pastor friend of mine called me, and he said, hey, I've got a cabin out on 30 acres out in the middle of nowhere. It's about an hour and a half from here, very, very secluded. And he said, I want, I, we built it so that pastors would use it, you know, as a place of prayer, as a place for their family to get away for a couple of days. And I thought, well, isn't this ironic? You know, God is leading, prompting me to go fast and pray. And then my pastor friend calls me and says, hey, I got this cabin, by the way. And I go out to this cabin. I'm the only one out there. There's nobody out there but me and some pudgy squirrels. That was it. And I'm out there for three days and I'm fasting and I'm, and I'm praying. And I want you to see this because I didn't, pray over the building, our location. My only prayer over that was, Lord, thank you that you already have the spot picked out, and I thank you for revealing it to Nicole and I. And that was it. The rest of the time, I was just spending time with him. I began to worship, play, play the piano, and just worship God, and just love on him, and I began to pursue him at a level that I'd never had before. I never really had before. And, and I had lots of hours of sitting either on the couch in front of the fireplace, or this is a really nice place he built, by the way. It was amazing. And I'd go out and, on the patio and, or on the porch and sit on the porch swing and overlook the lake. He owned both sides of the lake, so, I mean, there's nobody, you know, not even a lonely fisherman out there. And and I pursue his presence, come back, didn't think anything of it until the Lord revealed this to me this last week. That it wasn't long after I got back that 
I had the phone call with Pastor Eddie that opened up this opportunity, that he offered this location to us. Now, I don't believe that he offered this to us because I went and fasted and prayed, because I didn't go there with the motive to fast. God, I'm going to fast and pray until you give us this answer. No, I went to fast and pray to seek his presence. So, here's what, I, here's what I want to submit to you this morning. This is what I wrote down that God had put on my heart. In the midst of pursuing him, our needs are met. In the midst of pursuing him. Yeah, John, you just said it in, in Matthew 6. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things things will be added to you. So, look at Mark 8. Look at Mark 8. This is Jesus. And this large crowd comes to Jesus, and he preaches to them for three days. Three days. They get to be with Jesus. He's healing their sick. He is delivering people. He's praying with people. He's preaching the gospel, the good news to them, right? And he, and he does this for three days, and it's interesting. He makes this statement in verse 2. He says, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have had nothing to eat. <laughs> and if I send them away hungry, they're going to go to their houses and they'll faint on the way because some of them have come from a far distance. So, notice nobody has said anything about, I'm hungry. Jesus is the one bringing this up. Three days they've been with him. They're so enveloped in him and in his presence. Now, I got to be honest with you. The three days at the cabin, I got hungry. Hungry. I saw that grill sitting there. (laughs) Nicole's sending me videos of ribs. Okay. But I was in his presence. And so... His disciples answered him, how can we satisfy all these people here in the wilderness? Jesus said in verse 5, he said, how many loaves do you have? They said, seven. So, he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. He took the seven loaves. He gave thanks. He broke them. He gave them to his disciples. They set them before them, and they set them before the, the multitude. They also had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said, set them also before them. Look at verse 8. So, they ate and were filled. They ate and they were filled. Who met the need? Jesus Jesus did. Did they ask him to meet the need? Did they come to him saying, Lord, we're hungry. I mean, when are we going to eat around here? No, it says that they were with him for three days. Okay. Okay. I'm going somewhere in this because there's a place of pursuit where need becomes invisible. There's a place where you and I are so enveloped. I mean, have you ever been so excited about a project that you forget to eat? You're so enveloped, suddenly your hunger is invisible. It's not there because you're so wrapped up in what you're doing. Even more so when, you, when you're in His presence. And when you're in his presence and you're busy pursuing him, your need becomes invisible. Let me, let, me, let me say it this way. In the midst of pursuing him, our needs are met, right? I said that. So, for years, I have not prayed and asked God, not once, ever asked him to meet our need. Either as a family or as a church, ministry, when we traveled, Not once. And I want to explain to you why. And I want us to look at some key scriptures in this that really set me free in this. Uh, First one is over in Philippians chapter 4. Turn over there. Philippians chapter 4, the last third of that chapter, Paul talks about finances. He says, "I've, I've been content. I've been content in much to have much, but I've also been content to have little. So, you know, being content with much seems to make a lot of sense. I mean, 
You know, even when you're in pain, at least when you have money, you can go shopping or something, right? But to be content when you have nothing, when you have little, that's not as easy. How can you be content when you have little? Because your trust is in Him. That's how Paul was content. But look at this scripture. This is one of the key scriptures in Philippians. In chapter 4, verse 19, it says this, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. This was one of the key scriptures for me that literally set me free from ever having to ask God for my need to be met. Four words here after and and my says, God shall supply all. God shall supply all. Not some, not part, not a little bit, all. You know, you look that word up in the Greek, guess what it means? All. It's a real exciting word. And my God shall supply. The, the, the operative word in that sentence is shall. He shall. It's not a maybe. It's shall. Right? Okay. According to his riches of glory by Christ Jesus, not according to my ability to go out and make it happen on my own. According to his riches of glory by Christ Jesus. Let me show you another scripture that was key for me. It's over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. It says this, what soldier goes to war at his own expense? You join the military, everything's paid for. How many of you guys have been in the military? You got to be anybody? Yeah, Holly, yeah. Okay, so yeah, you get the clothes, the food, the place to sleep, all the tools to do your job. Let me show you another verse, Psalm 37, 25. This was another one. It was... I mean, we're talking about being free this morning. I think there's some people that need to get set free from being, having a relationship with God that's need-based, that we're pursuing Him for what we can get from Him instead of just pursuing Him for who He is and our needs being met in the process. All right, Psalm 37, look at verse 25. It says, I've been young and now I am old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. I want to read this same verse to you out of the message. I once was young. Now I'm a gray beard. How many gray beards I got in here besides me? All right. Gray beard, silver. Nicole calls it silver. Once I was young. Now I'm a gray beard. Not once have I seen an abandoned believer. Not once have I seen an abandoned believer or his kids out roaming the streets. Come on. Yeah. <sighs> that was a good place to say amen. amen. So, but I discovered this. Two things needed to be in place for me to have full confidence in him meeting my need. One is this. Am I doing, am I obeying what he told me to do? That's the first thing. Am I obeying what he told me to do? See, I'm a soldier in the army of God. Soldiers, they're under, they're submitted. They are commissioned. They're co to his mission, right? And his mission involves business. It involves um, um, being abundantly productive on your job. It involves for, the, for men to be the good provider that God has called us to be. We're supposed to go out and work the land, bring in money, right? So that's, that's important. <clears throat> but in the midst of that, I can still obey him. A man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So I'm supposed to be submitted to him. Am I obeying him? That's the first one. The second one is, am I in covenant? For us personally, one of the ways that we stay in covenant financially, personally, is that Nicole and I tithe. 10% of everything that comes in, we sow into the ministry. Secondly, <clears throat> the church tithes, Vision Church. 10% that comes in every week 
immediately comes off the top and we sow it into other ministries. And we're happy to do it. Uh, we support overseas missions. Um, we sow into local ministries and we sow into people that come and, and bless our church as well. So this is important because if you're obeying these things, you have every right to believe that all your needs are gonna be met. Your needs are gonna be met. It's not an if, it's not a maybe. They're going to be met. Because for me, this set me free from ever worrying about our needs again. And so we haven't, and what a blessing it's been. Let's look at another scripture over in Luke 22. Luke 22. Verse 35, Jesus, you remember that he had sent out 70. And he said, when you go out, he gave instructions, I don't want you to take anything with you. You know, uh, when you go into certain cities, uh, when they receive you, put your blessing on that city. If they don't, shake the dust off and go to the next town, you know. And so he gave them all these instructions. But listen, when they came back, listen to what Jesus said in verse 35. He said, when I sent you out to preach the good news and you did not, he said, and you did not have money or a traveler's bag or an extra pair of sandals, did you need anything? And they answered and said, nothing. Why did they not need anything? Because what soldier goes to war at his own expense? I, I had breakfast with a pastor just recently and he was asking me an interesting question. He um, they, they have some funding that was coming from other sources that's going to be going away. And so he was trying to get a grip on, you know, what the church budget was going to look like. And so he was asking me about, um, he did pledge cards on a Sunday. And he got pledges from everyone except their three biggest tithers. And he said, I don't know what to do with that. He said, so how do you feel? Or, what, you know, what do you think? And I said, well, first of all, I don't know who my three biggest tithers are. I, I wouldn't track that. I said, because what'll happen is you'll begin to look at people as dollar signs. And then they'll be the ones that you're leaning on when you need source, when you need resource, when you need money to come in. Because right now, the way it looks is you're looking to people to be your source instead of God to be your source. The first answer, qu question you need to answer is, did God call you here? Because I am in Arkansas for one reason. God called me here. And he won't let us go. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I, and no offense against Arkansas. I did, I did used to joke a lot about Arkansas. And I think in a way, God is paying me back. <laughs> in a way. But, because <laughs> I used to make fun of Arkansas. I'm from Oklahoma. I was born and raised in Oklahoma. I'm, an, I'm the only Okie in my family, by the way. Everybody else is from Kansas. And uh, God bless Kansas. And, uh, and God bless Oklahoma. <laughs> but here God brought me here. But he brought me here. So this is what obedience looks like. I'm here because I'm obeying my father. Well, I told this pastor, I said, the first question you need to answer is, did God call me to do this? Did he call me here? Did he call you to the company that you're in for this season? Not, not all seasons last forever, but if the answer is, yes, God has me here today. If you've gone to God and said, God, is this where you want me to be? And the answer is yes, then guess what? Your needs are going to be met. You don't have to pray and beg God, Lord, please meet this need. Because we get into this problem, this issue. And I've been there. I remember we had moved to Louisville, Kentucky, and we felt like God had called us there. And that we, and I really hadn't gleaned this, this understanding of these verses yet. And so we needed three, $3,500 within three days. Yeah, chew on that one. And I didn't have... I didn't have a job at the time. We had gone there. We were, uh, we were doing this ministry that God had called us to. And I said, Lord, I don't know what to do. And so I was so, I, you know, and then, and then what happens is anxiety comes in. 
and worry and concern and I'm not a good provider and all these feelings and and I got out in our neighborhood and we had this lived in this cute little neighborhood and I was just walking the street and I was just throwing my hands up in essence asking God intervene <laughs> I need you to intervene Lord well we had a miracle happen in in a couple of days and had the money were able to pay that bill and then God brought in provision another way but I remembered feeling exhausted like like it was something that I had done that convinced God to suddenly meet our need well that's pretty prideful I didn't do anything that caused God to give that money all right let me let me say it this way when you were a kid growing up when I was a kid I never went to my mom and dad and asked them for my needs to be met. Are you serious? No, I asked for my wants. Mom, I want, uh, come on, Paul, you can get with me on this, right? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I asked mom for what I, I remember one Christmas, I wanted this new stereo system. Remember, remember when those of you that are my age, the CDs came out? Remember? All right, because we're way past CDs, but they used to be called disc jockeys, the guys in the radio, because they were playing CDs back then. But, you know, so anyway, so this new stereo system came out, and, and I got every picture of it I could possibly get, and I cut them out, and mom remembers, I hung them in their closet, my dad would open his closet, there's this row of pants, and there's a stereo stuck right above his pants, and mom would go to the pantry and open the door, and there was another picture of the stereo, so, I mean, I put it everywhere, I put it on the steering wheel in his car, I mean, I was trying to think, how can I motivate my, what's, what am I doing? I'm trying to get my parents to match my want this Christmas. And they amazingly did. I'm so thankful to this day that they did, but they blessed me with that stereo system. And uh, I had it until Zach, I think you were born. Yeah, I had it all the way in Louisville. We gave it away with our house and stuff. But anyway, but kids, Come on, we, we don't ask our parents for our needs. Why? Because you're our parents. It's your responsibility to feed us. It's my responsibility to take care of my kids. I, I'm, I meet the need for my children, right? Okay, so, but, and so why wouldn't we expect that? How much more would God meet our needs? If we're a part of his family, and we're doing what he wants us to do. Yeah. We're in covenant. It's true. See, tithing is a huge covenant connector. Some people don't, don't realize that at times. But Jesus, they said, Lord, we lacked nothing when we went out. See, I've discovered many times that God is more interested in process than he is interested in outcome. Right. What he can develop in you. Like for instance, um, my good friend Richard in the back. Let's say Richard trains bus drivers and he, you teach him how to get their CDL, right? Yeah, he's a, he's a great bus instructor. Now, Richard, I, just what I know of him, he strikes me as a very detail-oriented guy. So it's a process learning your bus license, right? Learning about the bus, learning how to drive the bus, all the ins and outs to being a bus driver. So, so let's say he takes that student and he goes out on his maiden voyage. It's the first day of training. You know, I, wh when do they drive, Richard? When do they start driving? First day? Nope. How, how many days in? pre-trip all the class instruction 20 hours of bus theory wow 60 hours okay all right so let's say Richard gets wow there is a, so much more to bus driving than what I bus. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm laughing, but uh, it's a little side trip. You made me think. I went and got my haircut the other day, and where I get my haircut is a, is a school. So it takes them an hour and a half to cut my hair. And I don't have 
a whole lot of hair. I know. It's, I, that, I'm not saying that to flatter myself. It's just they're learning, okay? <laughs> and anyway, but so I was waiting for the guy that normally does my hair. He was wrapping up with another client. And these two big black dudes came in, and they were, they were sitting across from me, and they were waiting for their guy to get done too. And the one dude looks at me, and he goes, he goes, it takes 11 months to learn how to cut hair? He said, why does it take so long to learn how to cut hair? He goes, I mean, you can become a police officer in, what, six weeks or something? And I just started laughing. I was like, oh, my word. Okay. Anyway, so yeah, 60 hours. Wow. Okay, so let's say Richard gets an hour into training. He start, you're, you're teaching bus theory 101. We're going to start with the ignition or whatever it is. So you start, and, you're, and he's teaching this, and the student just isn't understanding the concept, and maybe they ask two, three questions about the same thing, and Richard decides, that's it. I, you fail. Bring the next student. You wouldn't do that, because Richard's amazing. Amazingly patient. And... So would God do that to you? No. Richard's going to take them all the way through the 60-hour, wow, process so that when they hit the streets, they can drive those kids to victory. They can drive them safely from point A to point B. Let me tell you what a good trip is. A good trip is when nothing happens and you get there safely. That's a good trip right? And so God wants to develop in us the same things in our faith. He wants to develop in us the kind of faith that's going to take us to victory. And I think some people lose their victory because they're so focused on needs, 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 needs. And their needs maybe aren't being met. <clears throat> I think it's time to ask some questions. Am I, am I obeying what God told me to do? In my covenant. Because ever since then, and ever since we made that decision, and we took these, I took these scriptures at face value and said, I believe it. I'm taking these scriptures personally, and I'm walking this out. Then guess what? I, there's not been a single time that our needs have not been met. It blows me away. Literally blows me away. Because God is so good. All right. Turn over to Isaiah 37. I'm going to ask Rebecca to come. In fact, just the whole worship team, come back. Yeah. <clears throat> Isaiah 37 is an interesting, interesting story because this is King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah was a king that pleased God. He was, he was a man that went after God with his whole heart. And an interesting thing that happened to him was that he was attacked by the Assyrian king. And the Assyrian king came and he attacked three uh, or a few of the Judah uh, cities that were fortified and he took them. And the people that escaped from those cities, they ran to Jerusalem. So once he took possession of these, three, you know, these few cities, then he decided to attack Jerusalem and lay siege to Jerusalem. So, so he sent a messenger and then he sent a written message. Now Hezekiah tried to deal with this problem on his own at first. He sent... Um, the king of Assyria a message and he said, well, you know, what can I do so that you won't attack me anymore? What can I give you? And he said, well, if you give me this many tons of silver and gold, then I'll leave you alone. And so he did. He got all the silver together. He got all the gold together. They even stripped gold off of the temple of God to be able to send that. And they sent it to him. And then the king of Assyria said, psych, I'm going to attack you anyway. So now Hezekiah, now he sends Hezekiah a letter. Hezekiah sent word to Isaiah. Isaiah 
the prophet is alive during this time. And it says in verse 14 of chapter 37, it says, after Hezekiah received the letter and the messenger read it, I want you to notice what he did. He went up to the Lord's temple and he spread it out before the Lord. So the first thing that he did was he took it to God. How many, how many of you guys my age uh, remember that old DC talk song, Take It to the Lord? You got to take it to the Lord. Okay. Anyway, that's a good song. YouTube it. Thank you. One person. Okay. 50, verse 15. Then Hezekiah prayed this prayer before the Lord. O Lord of heaven's armies. God of Israel, you are enthroned between the mighty cherubim. You alone are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You alone created the heaven and the earth. Notice what he did. He honored God for who he is and what he can do. And then this last point I want you to really focus on because this is, this is a really important point that oftentimes we miss. In verse 17, Hezekiah went on to say, bend down, O Lord, and listen. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to Sennacherib's words of defiance against the living God. So Hezekiah makes it about the king of Assyria and what he's saying about God. He's not making it about his dilemma and his problem. He's not dropping to his knees and saying, God, we're in, we're in a pickle here. I mean, this is a pickle. No, he's making it about the fact that he has blasphemed the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. In verse 18, it says, it is true, Hezekiah goes on to say, it is true, Lord, that the kings of Assyria have destroyed all the nations. See, faith doesn't deny the facts, it, but it understands that God is greater than the facts and can change the facts. This is important. All right, then verse 20, he says, now, O Lord, our God, rescue us from his power. Then all the kingdoms of the earth will know that you alone, O Lord, are God. In other words, we want them to know you the way we know you. We want them to understand who you really are. And then Isaiah 37, verse 33, Isaiah gives the response of the Lord. Listen to what the Lord says. And this is what the Lord says to the king of Assyria. His armies will not enter Jerusalem. They will not even shoot an arrow at it. They will not march outside its gates with their shields, nor build banks of earth against its walls. The king will return to his own country by the same road in which he came. He will not enter the city, thus saith the Lord. Verse 36. It says, that night the angel of the Lord went out of the, to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. When the surviving Assyrians woke up the next morning, they found the corpses everywhere. That would be not fun. And then the king, then King Sennacherib of Assyria broke camp. He returned to his own land. He went home to his capital, Nineveh, and stayed there. And then he was killed by the sword by his two own sons conspired against him and killed him. So again, <clears throat> take it to the Lord. Honor God for who he is, what he can do. Don't make it about your problem. Make it about who he is, that he's the answer. Jesus is the answer. It's not just a cool Andre Crouch song that we sing. He is the answer. There's no other. All right. So I want to end with this scripture over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> and this scripture has... So much of Scripture is just amazing. But, you know, I told you that those three verses I sent, I, that I shared with you set me free from ever worrying about our needs being met again. And I'm just so grateful um, for that. But this, uh, this Scripture that we're getting ready to read has set us free literally from um, worrying about trials and tests 
that come our way. Look at what it says in verse 13. I'm going to read it first to you out of the New King James Version. It says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond that which you are able. But with the temptation will also make a way of escape so that you will be able to bear it. That word temptation obviously means tests and trials if you look it up in the Greek. Now I want to read it to you out of the Passion Translation. It says, we all experience times of testing, which is normal for every human being. But God will be faithful to you. He will screen and filter the severity, nature, and timing of every test and trial you face so that you can bear it. Let me tell you, what you're going through right now, you can bear it. Because God didn't, wouldn't allow it otherwise. Meaning, you can get all the way through it and come out victorious on the other side of it. Well, that's, that's a lot better news than your response was, but. And each test is an opportunity to trust him more. For along with every trial, God has provided for you a way of escape that will bring you out of it victoriously. Ah. See, God wants to develop in you and I this process. He wants to develop in us the ability uh, in each section of walking through the process so that we can make it through victoriously. So we know what to do in the next situation. Because the amazing thing to me is that I've walked through many times of wondering whether or not our needs were going to be met, whether or not our needs were going to be met, whether or not our needs were going to be met. Are we going to make it through? Are we going to make it through? Are we going to make it through? And going through that enough times and God dealing with me in scriptures, it literally set me free. Phil, are you saying that you've never experienced lean times ever since? No, we have. We have, but it hasn't altered the trust in me because what God has developed in me through going through the trials has established me in resolved faith that you can't shake me off of it. And this right here is fruit of his favor. Fruit of his interest in your needs being met. Why would God provide a, a situation like this for us if he didn't have a purpose and a plan for what he wants to do? And this is not supposed to just be for the church. This is supposed to be for every person individually in here. Your job is not your source. It is a resource that God uses. He's our source. He is our source. It's a, it's a, it's a mind frame of thinking that we have to change. Because in the midst of doing what you do for the company that you do, he will cause you to be blessed above and beyond because your hope is in him, not in this company's stock value. I told you guys about how I worked for a company. Before we went on the road, I, I was making 75 grand a year and I was poised to, to jump over a hundred within two, three months. And here we're going on the road to, with no salary, to travel in ministry. Just encourages you, doesn't it? I mean, <laughs> that lift your face, boost, boost you. And, and I was working this job though, but I was working as unto the Lord. The Lord had really shown me how, how to work for him and to please my boss. And I remember my boss called me into his office and, and it was the kind of job that that there was residual to every account you had. So similar to some of you guys, some of the things that you do. So if I had a certain account, then it paid so much each month for me. And so my boss called me into his office one day and he said, hey, I just wanna let you know that I dropped a couple more deals in your account. He said, and, and they were the top tier deals. And I was like, why would you do that? I said, I mean, that's amazing, thank you, but why would you give me something I didn't earn? He said, because you're earning it by staying on the phone. 
because of my diligence, because I was being faithful, because I was working as unto the Lord and not as unto something else, God was giving me favor. And let me tell you, when the Lord told us to go and travel and there was no promise or guarantee of any kind of a salary at all, a lump shot up in my throat. And I remember thinking, man, how is this going to happen? How how would this even be possible? How are we going to travel? Where's the money going to come from? How am I going to feed my family? I mean, I know how your minds work because mine works exactly the same way. (laughs) It goes right to how are we going to pay for stuff? Where's the money going to come from? And I remember the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, just share the vision. Just share what you're going to do. And I did. I sat down with business people that I knew and I shared with them the vision. And within three months, we were on the road with full support and the support never went away. We have some partners that supported us continuing even even up to last month. And we haven't been on the road in how many years? Five years? I haven't even been on the road. But God put that on their heart. See, he was meeting our need. We had a, we had a lady that gave us a, a 38-foot RV with a slide and everything to travel in. Debt free. Oh, God, I wonder if you want me to go on the road. I'm not sure. But see, his faithfulness, that wasn't my decision. Does that make sense? That wasn't a decision that I made. I surrendered. I I became commissioned. Now I'm co-partnering God with your mission. That's what submission is. It's you and I being sub to his mission. His mission comes first. I'm hoping that this is ringing some bells with you guys. And I I know some of you, this may be, you know, hey, Phil, I've been walking in this and and God's been so good to me and and rah, rah. But But I believe many of you, that's not the case. I believe that you have been like Hezekiah was and you tried to meet the need on your own. You tried to strip the gold off of the temple walls and and gather all the silver that you could and throw it at the problem and hopefully that problem would go away and it just comes back. All right. Well, I wanna wanna pray for you. 